Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. Um, I, I could try and do a, a professional introduction to this episode, but the fact of the matter is that right now Alina is sitting somewhere in Poland under house arrest, um, squealing with her microphone on mute. So I'm just going to let her do it. I'm going to let her interview, uh, let her introduce even our guest for today. Alina, who is with us? So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honoured to have on our podcast today the fabulous historian Roger Morehouse. He has published some best-selling books about the Berlin Wall, Hitler-Stalin Pact, but primarily he's here to talk about his newest book, First to Fight, uh, about the 1939 September campaign and the invasion of Poland. Welcome, Roger. We're really pleased to have you. Hello, Lena. Hello, Alex. Nice to be hey. here. So how are you getting on, Roger? First of all, whereabouts are you calling us from? Uh, I'm in Hertfordshire, sunny Hertfordshire. Oh, okay, so um, we've had a few London. I'm all right. I'm doing fine, actually. Yeah, yeah so... I'm from London. I'm, I'm absolutely fine, because it, it, it's funny, the, um, you know, being locked down like everyone is, um, it's kind of a bit like my life. So, you know, it's kind of normal, really. I sit in my office and <laughs> do my thing, and uh, people are sort of moaning about social isolation, and I say, well, it's just what it's like to be an author, to be honest with you. So, Kim, uh, this is the thing, isn't yeah, it? I'm yeah. sitting there watching Boris's announcement the other day going, you will not go outside unless it's to find food, and you will not hang around with other people in large groups and have any fun. And I'm like, yeah, that, yeah. that's basically my life. Most of the people that's we hang life, out with yeah. are dead anyway, so... Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's very little adjustment for a historian slash author. It's I feel. very true. Yeah, it's but very true. Actually. We've got to ask you about this because last Monday we had Guy Walters on. What is this about his lawnmower and you coming to the rescue? Um, to and, and I think he's actually irritated with you for coming to the rescue because it meant he actually did have to cut the grass. But uh, did you seriously have to remotely fix his lawnmower for him? Well, I, I gave, I, I gently gave him some advice on on how he might fix his lawnmower. Um, you know, he he said he said on, I think it was on Sunday that uh, you know he was trying to do the lawn and and the lawnmower wasn't working. And I and I very gently said maybe you want to put some fresh fuel in it. And he think shot back and said, "Don't talk about things you know nothing about." And I said, "Well." Um, uh, you know, I'm, I said I, I did have a BTEC in motor engineering at one point in another life, which he couldn't believe. So anyway, so we kind of batted it around like that. And I think the fundamental problem here with people like Guy, you know, sort of, you know, Guy's a lovely chap, he's a good mate, but he's, uh, as, a, as an ex Etonian, I think he's uh, unused to uh, doing anything with his hands, so certainly getting them dirty by, by fixing things like lawnmowers. Are you, so, are you, uh, you, know, are you that's, saying his butler's in self-isolation and therefore this is why he's... I think that Napoleon. might be the problem. Uh. <laughs> I think that might be the problem. His gardener, his man... Uh, they're all in self-isolation, and now he has to do all the dirty jobs himself, unfortunately. Oh, I do have to say, as someone who wrote a book on Eton, lay off for the OEs. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> very funny. I mean, I, I, it did make me laugh. It's like, how many historians does it take to fix a lawnmower? But um, the answer is yeah, actually exactly. only one if he's got any common sense. Only one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's talk history. We are talking a bit of history. So what we actually want to know is uh, a bit more about your book. How did you come up with the idea? But before, just, just a little bit before we get to that point, I just want to tell everybody that you've got to read chapter eight. Chapter eight, best chapter. <laughs> is it, it oh, really is. Alina, is this the one that's about your great grandfather? It is. Roger writes about my great grandfather and I love it. I absolutely love it. So he was, uh, he was the general in charge of the defense of Lvov, uh, General Władysław Langner. And um, Roger writes a lot about him. So obviously when I bought the book, that's the first chapter I went to. I, I just, just went straight to it. It started with me. I was like, oh my God, how amazing is this? This is so cool. And I just could not, <laughs> just, just, I just, yeah. It was a Lena? total geeky fan moment. Yes. Lena, can I break something to you? No. The German invasion of Poland in 1939 was not all about you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. That's great that your great grandfather is in it. But let's uh, we'll we'll get to that. Um, Guy, definitely we yeah. uh, we want you to tell us why why this moment in World War Two. Guy or Roger? Well, sorry, Guy. Like Roger, because you talked about <laughs> Guy. That really offensive <laughs> to you. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, no, well, this was the last book I did. Uh, the last big book was 2014, was the Devil's Alliance about the Nazi Soviet Pact. 
um, and which is, you know, very, I think, completely misunderstood um, uh, episode in, in the history of the war and, you know, generally, it's, it's kind of not really understood at all, I think, in the, in the British narrative. Um, but I kind of, um, with doing that book, the, the sort of the big glaring gap for that, um, you know, made me see much more clearly was, was the September campaign, which is another one that I think is, is a, an episode that we don't really understand very well in the Western narrative of the war. Um, there's lots of sort of mythology around it and there's, which is still, you know, still battered around today and repeated in ignorance and, you know, even, I mean, you just, uh, not, not having a go at you, obviously, you know, you know, we all have our areas of specialism, but Alex, you just said just now, you know, the German invasion of Poland in 39, and on that, yet yeah, you're right, but there are two invasions of Poland in 39, the Germans and the Soviets, right, so this is one of those key things that, you know, we have to sort of remind ourselves at every turn, it's not just the Germans in 39, it's not just the Germans who are the bad guys in 39 either, so I do, I do have really to confess to, uh, to you, to, Roger, to do better that six months yeah. ago, I was still referring to this as the LOLO war. So, right, yes. <laughs> yeah, she did. She was, she was. It's, it's, emba it's deeply embarrassing. Yeah, uh, <laughs> about a year ago, uh, if it, hadn't, it wasn't in an episode of Band of Brothers or um, it wasn't in LOLO, then I would never have heard of it. So let's give you some questions from people who actually know what they're talking about because we've had lots. Alina, who was first? Okay. So Shane, um, our war gen guy, which, uh, yeah. which we all know, uh, Shane asks, is it true that the Polish government in exile published a white paper giving a general view of Poland's relations with Germany between 1933 and 1939 that yeah. included the revelation that Hitler tried to involve Poland in a plot to attack the Soviet Union? Right. Uh, yeah, there's, a, there's some, a little bit mixed up there. Um, there was there's what's called the white book which was published by the Polish government in exile as part of their effectively sort of propaganda campaign during the war. I think it was published in 42, which was exactly what he just described, was a, was a you know, collection of documents of um, German-Polish relations between 33 and 39. Um, and it's very, I mean, it's very useful. I've got it on my shelves behind me. It's a very useful um, document. But then the other thing that he's, that he's describing there is a little bit confused. Um, the... Poles actually considered making a preemptive attack on Germany in '33, and it, this was sort of discussed, um, and 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 eventually sort of thought against it because when Hitler comes to power, and they think this is the time to maybe uh, nip things in the bud. But they decided against for various reasons. So I think that's probably what he's referring to, but in a slightly uh, slightly mixed up way. Uh, and then later on in '39, as part of the part of the uh, the German effort to kind of um, uh, essentially destabilise Poland, but also to try and try and shake it away from its Western, um, not yet alliances, but its Western alignments. Um, the Germans also suggested joining forces with them to attack the Soviet Union, but that's in '39. But the, the fundamental of this is that the, you know Poland's position in, in between the wars is very much one. You know, it's the worst place in the world. Effectively, you've got Hitler on one side and Stalin on the other after 33. So, you know, it's, it's pretty much in the 1930s, the worst place in the world to be. Um, so consequently, Poland's foreign policy in that time is, is quite a difficult balancing act. And the, and the policy they had effectively was to not deal, not sort of make deals and treaties and so on with either side. They weren't going to align themselves with either side to try and sort of maintain that balance. So it's a very, very difficult situation they were in. So that kind of answers Shane's question, I hope. But it is it, the question was a little bit mixed up but uh, hopefully that makes it make, some, make more sense no completely i mean we've got a couple of other questions that um i'm gonna let alex take a little bit of uh, uh some question taking so go for it <laughs> i think you're right um roger in the sense that if there's one place you want to be in in history least of all it's in a hitler stalin sandwich but um absolutely yeah adam zukov would like to know he says stalin attended the signing of the molotov ribbentrop pact but hitler didn't why yeah. did stalin go yeah. but hitler didn't are there ramifications unseen in each man's decision is it nothing more than the meeting took place in moscow he says it's weird to him that stalin allowed the photo Right. Yeah. And there's, I mean, th that's a good point. There's lots of photos of, you know, the signing of the Nazi Soviet pact, August 23rd, 40, uh, 39, sorry, 
um, with you know Stalin smiling very very happily, having you know signed the pact with uh, with Ribbentrop, because Hitler's foreign minister went to Moscow to do it. I think the bottom line in this question is yes, you know he also kind of answers his own question in a way. I think the fundamental reason that Hitler doesn't go is because it's done in Moscow. Um, you know, Ribbentrop flies to Moscow. He gets the green light from Stalin to go and, and negotiate stuff. A lot of the groundwork of the negotiation had, had all been done remotely. Um, and then he gets the green light to go and, you know, sort of cross the T's and dot the I's, which he goes and does. And that happens in the Kremlin. And it's actually, it is, it is significant that Stalin turns up at all. For, so, you know, for example, the, the, Pol uh, the German foreign minister von der Schulenberg was, was there as well, was in that group in the Kremlin. Um, and he'd been German foreign minister in Moscow for something like four or five years by that point. And he'd never actually seen Stalin in the flesh. He'd never, he'd never been with Stalin in the same room. So Stalin was, was quite a sort of elusive character. And for him to actually be there and be leading the, the negotiations, which he was, is quite significant. So this was Stalin's policy. It's quite an interesting point. You know, it's called the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. It should really be called the Hitler-Stalin Pact, the Nazi-Soviet Pact, I call it. Um, but it's very much Stalin's signature policy, although he let his foreign minister kind of uh, attach his name to it. Um, so yeah, that, that aspect is significant, but the fact that Hitler isn't there is much more just to do with geography and logistics, I would suggest. Just reminding our viewers, Roger's book is called The Devil's Alliance, uh, Hitler's Pact with Stalin, which is what he's just mentioned in, in, yeah. uh, in how he calls it, not the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, but yeah. the Hitler-Stalin Pact. I do. Yes. So let's move on to some other questions. I mean, we've got a, we've got a few um, on the uh, Hitler-Stalin Pact. Let's get that right. Yeah. Uh, Models TPS asks, uh, how important was the Soviet Nazi Pact signature prior to the invasion? Yeah. Was it the reason for the delay from an August to September invasion? Yeah, again, that's slightly um, mixed up uh, chronology in the question. So the, the Nazi Soviet Pact is signed on the 23rd of August, 39. And then there is a response. So the Poles respond by basically looking for concrete foreign alliances. And they, they, um, they already have a commitment from the British and a commitment from the French, but they look to sort of um, solidify those a bit more. And on the 25th of August, so two days later, there is the signature of the Anglo-Polish military agreement, um, which is essentially response to the Nazi-Soviet pact, right? Uh, and it's that um, military arrangement with the British that uh, forces Hitler to delay his attack on Poland. He'd originally planned to attack Poland, I think, on, at dawn on the 26th of August, so the following day. And the signature of that pact uh, with the British meant that he delayed it uh, until the 1st of dawn on the 1st of September because he wanted to see whether there would be any fallout, you know, whether, whether Mussolini would come in with him. Um, he wanted to sort of, you know, see whether he could isolate the Poles any further, uh, just see how, the, how the, that sort of changed the kaleidoscope of, of relations uh, in that last week of August. It didn't much, so he attacked then on 1st of September. So it's not necessarily the pact that forces the delay, it's the Anglo-Polish response to the pact, if that makes sense. Can I, can I move away from that just to ask you, um, we had a really interesting yeah. question come in from Monsieur, and he asked, and I really want to know the answer to this, can I ask why Poland and the Poles were so despised and victimised by the Germans oh. and the Russians? I would suspect there's wow. no quick answer to that, but can you give us a sense? Wow. Well, yeah, I mean, look, it's, I mean, that, we, we have to be a bit careful I suppose of um, overplaying that we don't want to we don't want to sort of cause an international uh, uh, incident be between those three countries certainly not 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 these days I mean relations with the Germans the Poles are generally pretty good not so great with the Russians but that's uh, you know another another question for another day <laughs> um, but certainly historically speaking yeah and there, there was a there was a good degree of sort of you know contempt certainly um, the, the German relationship with the Poles is an interesting one because it's a bit, it's a little bit like the British relationship with the Irish in a strange way. So the Germans tended to look down on the, on the Poles. They tended to view them as their sort of country cousins who were a bit primitive and a bit stupid. Uh, and it was very much that sort of, you know, they, they wanted to civilize them in inverted commas. So they wanted to make them Germans like we wanted to make the Irish British in that, in that sense. It's kind of, in the 19th century, it's kind of a similar relationship in that sense. 
So the Germans saw themselves as being sort of, you know, uh, innately superior to the Poles. Um, and the uh, Poles are a very, you know, proud nation with a proud culture and proud traditions and all the rest of it. Great, great sort of great history behind them as well. And of course, in the 19th century, Poland wasn't on the map. It's, it's, it's been uh, partitioned by its, by its big neighbours. Uh, disappears between um, 1795 and 1918. Um, so th that that is the essence of that original German kind of um, um, not really contempt is too strong a word, but it certainly certainly looked down on the Poles. And then if you jump forward to the 1930s and the you know the the, the, the uh, Hitler and the Nazis in in power, then there's a much stronger um, real Polonophobia that comes out of that, and that's basically because Poland basically is reformed in 1918 and takes territory that the Germans considered to be to be wholly German. Um, so there's a real contempt that kicks in there. And crucially with the with the Germans as well, it's kind of biological. It's kind of, you know, these people are Poles and they are biologically doomed, you know. So it's a very different um, element um, from the old fashioned kind of, uh, you know, the, 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 the Germans looking down their noses at the Poles. Um, so that is kind of, uh, that, that hopefully makes a bit of sense of that one. And in terms of the Russian, the Russian relationship with the Poles is also a difficult one. It's very, you know, rooted very deeply in history. If you go back to 1610, for example, uh, the Poles actually, you know, what, at this point, Poland is one of the largest, most powerful states in Europe. And the Poles actually go and sack Moscow in 1610. And this was never forgotten. This is the advent, actually, when the Romanovs come to power. This is the beginning of the Robin, Romanov period. Um, and that was never forgotten in Moscow that the Poles came and sort of desecrated the, um, you know, the the the, uh, the Russian capital. Um, and then going forward, you know, Russia grows in power as Poland then weakens in power in the 18th century, particularly. You've got the partitions. Then in the 19th century, got got um, Polish risings, successive risings, mainly against Russian rule, also against German rule as well, but mainly against the Russians. So the the Russians kind of view the Poles as again as sort of you know inveterate troublemakers they're just people who are you know forever frustrating russian ambition they're always in the way they're always causing a problem and then again you jump forward to the 1930s and, and you've got a new regime coming in with, with with communism which adds a whole new whole new veneer of ideology to that traditional um you know rivalry and 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 contempt in a way uh, and of course, Pol the Poles block the Soviet expanse westwards, expansion westwards in 1920 at the Battle of the Vistula. So, you know, there's um, there's all sorts of historic reasons why that why there was you know a real um, tension, to put it very lightly, a real tension between those three capitals, between Moscow, uh, Warsaw, and Berlin, and that all kind of you know it essentially crystallizes in 1939. Um, this is actually a little bit down my line of work, which is why I find this question really interesting. Um, it's about, obviously, Poland and World War II. Um, but is there any information on Jewish involvement in the Polish military up to the invasion? Mm. And is there any evidence of anti-Semitism in the Polish military at the time? And that's asked by a Holocaust reader. OK. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, Poland, uh, the Polish Republic, as it's reformed in 1918, um, is you know essentially by definition it expands and it, it expands both eastwards and westwards it takes a lot of those disputed territories um from both germany and from the soviet union and fall from russia um so it ends up as it's reformed in 1918 after 1918 as a multinational state and there is a sort of a, a paradox there because it because it's been reformed and it's you know it's the heir to all of that sort of polish tradition and all of that um, it's regained its independence after 123 years in the wilderness when it wasn't present on the map. Poland, Poland's sort of ruling ethos is actually quite nationalistic, and yet it is a multinational state. So there's an inherent tension there in the Second Republic between 39, uh, 1918 and 39, um, and there is a, a large Jewish population as well. So that's there, there are there are sort of ethnic tensions within um, the Second Polish Republic. That certainly is true. Um, and again, the Polish army has has all of those nationalities, Jews as well, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Germans even, all conscripted and all, all sort of within the army structure. So, you know, they are all there and it would be a fool who would say, no, of course, relations were always rosy and there was never a problem. 
you know, there, there were problems as there were across the world. You have to bear in mind that, you know, it's, it's easy to point the finger at the Germans and say that, you know, that regime was horribly anti-Semitic and it absolutely was. But anti-Semitism is not just a German disease in the, in the 1930s. It, it's sort of, it's represented right across Europe and elsewhere and in America and everywhere else. It's fundamental difference between German Nazi anti-Semitism and other forms of anti-Semitism is that Nazi anti-Semitism is, is sort of, first of all, it's kind of biological, it's pseudo-scientific, right? Um, so it didn't matter if individual Jews converted or if their grandparents had converted to Christianity, they were still viewed by the Nazis as being, you know, intrinsically biologically Jewish. Um, whereas for, for other, other cultures, if you like, that wouldn't, wouldn't have been a problem. Um, so it's kind of pseudo-scientific, it's biological, and secondarily, it's exterminatory. So it actually wants to exterminate them. It doesn't just want to sort of push them out, take them somewhere else, get them out of the way, get, make sure that they're not, you know, economic competition or whatever reason it is, the, 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 the Nazi ideology actually wants to exterminate them. So there are two fundamental differences. So really kind of comparing anti-Semitisms is a, a bit of a fool's game because you can't compare much with Nazi anti-Semitism. It's a very particular thing. So yes, the short answer, there is anti-Semitism in, in war Poland, absolutely. But it's not of the Nazi sort, crucially. Um, so there is going to be anti-Semitism within the Polish military. But that said, again, it's, you know, it's quite a melting pot. It actually works rather well. Um, there's, there's very little um, evidence I've seen of some real fundamental sort of racial and ethnic tensions within the Polish military uh, in 1939 until the uh, Soviet invasion, crucially. Um, 17th of September, the Soviets invade um, Eastern Poland um, in 39, and that's where a lot of those Belarusian and Ukrainian uh, soldiers within the Polish army begin to kind of um, uh, desert and begin to kind of think, well, maybe maybe we're, we, we should kind of, you know, uh, uh, vote with our feet, if you like. Um, so you can see there's ethnic, those tensions come to the fore there, but I've not really seen much in, in the way of of anti-Semitic, uh, fundamental anti-Semitic problems uh, in the Polish army. Oh, um, so, quick question. You, sorry, you, you were in Warsaw, weren't you, last week? Or the week before? A uh, week before, yeah. yeah. Uh, at the, the, the Jewish cemetery, if I'm not mistaken. That's right, yeah, I did, I did visit the, um, the Jewish cemetery, which is absolutely amazing, I have to say. I've not, I've not been before. It's right next to Powązki, and so I've been to Powązki many times, which is the big, almost like the sort of the Highgate Cemetery of Warsaw. Uh, where the yeah. girls were good and all the generals are and all the rest of it. I've been to Powązki a few times, but literally um, on the other I... side of the wall is the Jewish cemetery, which is just the most amazing place, and, and you can literally lose yourself in there. Well, we'll definitely get those photos up online. Um, moving on, we have a question from Wojtek. Um, he says, Roger, in your book, do you describe the Polish Brit Blitzkrieg, in inverted commas, <laughs> carried out yeah. by uh, General Roman Abraham, who made quick inroads into the German territory at the beginning of September 1939? Yeah, uh, this is what I call the Fraustadt Raid. Um, this was, yes, I do cover it in the book as a short answer. Um, this was a, a Polish attack into uh, Silesia, actually, German province of Silesia, concentrating on the town of Fraustadt. And, uh, and they did actually, that, you know, they sent their, um, it was bicycle troops and cavalry, predictably, um, who sort of, you know, conducted this lightning raid and obviously found themselves uh, between German armies or somehow more or less, pretty much unopposed and, and took, took quite a few German um, villages and towns before they, they retreated back again. This was on the 2nd of September. Um, I think it's often, I mean, it's a very interesting episode and it was reported in the Polish press at the time as being, you know, look how great we are, we're, uh, we're, we're taking the fight to the Germans. Um, but I think we should be wary of kind of extrapolating from that and saying, you know, this is what might have been possible because I think it's kind of, it's kind of anomalous effectively. So the, the Germans are attacking with with much greater force than the Poles could, could muster at the time. There were greater numbers of everything, of trucks, of tanks, of aircraft, of men, of, even of horses. Um, now, I make the point in the book that the, Poles are not, the Polish army is not the primitive beast that we think it is in 1939. It actually would stand up pretty well to most European armies, um, but the German army was the most advanced, both technologically, um, uh, doctrinally as well, you know, the Blitzkrieg doctrine as well, um, and in numbers, in, in, in sort of motorization and, and armor. So 
you know, they are fighting the most advanced military force on the planet in 1939, and that's what fundamentally explains their their failure. Um, but the, the Polish army is not, you know, as I say, it's not the sort of primitive antediluvian uh, force that we think it is. It's it's much more, much uh, better equipped than that. It's much better at what it's doing than that. It's just up against someone, a force that it was much better than it was. We've, um, we've actually got another question from Models TPS. So we're going to take a slightly different direction. Yeah. Um, so had the Poles ignored the French and British requests to delay mobilisation? Would that have helped getting the Polish troops in position earlier and provided for better battlefield communications, as they'd have, uh, as they would have, as they would have been set up? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the British and the French um, prevailed upon the Poles to delay their mobilisation right at the end of the end of August '39, um, for the bizarre reason that they were so so desperate to try and maintain the peace. Of course, the peace was, you know, disappearing. Was was um, disappearing through their through their fingers at that point, um, but they were so desperate to try and preserve the peace that they were they they wanted their their allies the poles basically not to do anything that could be construed as provocative to the Germans bizarrely right so they prevailed upon them not to mobilize so there's this sort of piecemeal mobilization a, a secret mobilization that's partially done and Polish forces are sort of mobilized to you know something like about sixty or seventy percent. So a lot of forces are, are incomplete, you know, they don't have their full complement of men or material, they're not necessarily in the right place where they should be. So this does really, you know, this does hamper Poland's preparations for the German attack on the 1st of September. Um, but I think, again, to extrapolate from that and say that Poland might have, uh, it certainly would have resisted better, I think that's obvious, it would have resisted a bit better, but whether that would have saved Poland's skin in '39, I very much doubt because of that, because of that disparity that I mentioned just now. You know, they are fighting the the, the most advanced and best equipped military force on the planet. So, you know, maybe that extra 30% of men and material would have made a moment, you know, a difference. You know, maybe maybe extended the campaign for a few weeks, but I really don't think it would have actually um, saved Poland's skin, unfortunately. So it's another one of those things that. You know, people often point to and say, well, maybe that could have made a difference. Yeah, it would have made a difference, but it wouldn't have changed the results. That's the problem. Um, Dominic Lipnicki has, has kind of on the same theme asked, could and should the Allies have done more to help Poland in 1939? Yeah, I mean, that's that's another one of these, um, you know, big questions that I try and address in the book. Um, I think we, in our Western narrative, we kind of view... Polish campaign a little bit in parentheses so we, we kind of separate it out and it's and it's separate from our war it's it happens over there in Eastern Europe and it's a long way away and it's you know to, to paraphrase um, you know, Chamberlain when he was talking about um, you know, the Czech crisis of the previous year it's a faraway place of which we know little and, and we're not really that bothered about it but if you look at it from the other perspective which is what I try and do in the book if you look, look at it from a Polish perspective the September campaign is very much part of what they viewed as an inter-allied operation, right? So they viewed themselves as the allies of the British and the French, and they expected the British and the French to do something to help them. That's what that's what those two allies had said they would do. Um, so then when the British and the French effectively do nothing, and I should, again, I will explain what they do do in a minute, um, that is viewed in Poland with a considerable amount of dismay, to say the least. Um, so the British, for example, carry out, there's limited uh, bombing raids on, on, particularly on naval targets um, in the early, in the first week or so of September 39. And they also carry out leafleting raids. So they drop about, you know, uh, millions of, I think 12 million leaflets are dropped over Western Germany, basically asking, imploring the German people to stop being so beastly to the Poles. Um, which, all of which, of course, has very, very, very little effect whatsoever. Um, the French are a bit more proactive, so they 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 had promised to attack, uh, you know, um, promised the, the Poles that they would attack on land, attack Western Germany. Um, they start what's called the Saar Offensive, I think, uh, from memory, on the 8th of September. They get about five kilometres um, into the Saar land, which is, you know, the, the sort of western tip of, of Western Germany. Um, and uh, at which point they kind of, you know, someone fires a rifle at them and they turn around and go home again. So it, it sort of redefines half-hearted. 
So both the British and the French, you know, they're kind of going through the motions, but not actually doing anything of any substance at all. And my argument would be, if they're willing to go that far, they should have, you know, if they'd done something with some real vigour behind them, I, you know, the, if the British are willing enough to drop leaflets on, on Western Germany, they could have, they could, you know, uh, logistically and, and, and technologically, it would have been possible to drop bombs. Um, and again, the French are invading Western Germany. Just do it with a bit more vigour and a bit and and you know more armour and more personnel, and actually mean it. Now, had the British and the French actually done something vigorous in September '39, and I think again it could have had an effect because it it would have obliged the Germans to to pull forces away from the Polish theatre to meet those threats in the West, right? So it would have lessened the pressure on the Poles. Again, I don't think it would have changed the end result um, of the September campaign. It might have extended it. It might have made it even more bloody than it was. And it's an extremely bloody campaign. Um, but I don't think it would have changed the result. But it is still, that, set, that aside, it is still, I think, a sort of rather shameful episode in British and French history because we did uh, commit and promise to help the Poles in 39 and we did effectively nothing to meet that, that commitment. And I think that's rather shameful. It does sound like That's quite a, the controversy. Um, just c there's a lot of myths going around. And uh, Roger, I was talking to Alina about this because I've heard lots of nonsense about this period. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah. she mentioned one in particular about the Polish cavalry charging at German tanks. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah. And did it happen? Yeah, this is one of those. This always comes up, and it's it's, it's a sort of an old you know historical canard. Um, you know the the, the myth of of Poles um, charging German tanks. Um, it, it's kind of gone down in history, really. It's, it's something that it came essentially from German propaganda of the war. Um, and it became their dominant propaganda narrative. So it's a very easy way of them sort of telling the story of the war and telling it in such a way as to make themselves look superior. So not only militarily superior, but obviously this is the Nazis we're talking about. So, you know, by extension, racially superior as well. And the Poles obviously militarily and racially inferior to them um, so that was that's that's the origin of it is it you know it comes from our, it comes from German propaganda of the war and then it's kind of been propagated ever since essentially um, you know there's a um, even you know the great Polish filmmaker Andrzej Wajda um, I think his first film actually from the 1950s about 1957 um, was called Lotna and it's a, and it's there's a scene in that film which is of Polish cavalry charging German tanks, you know, with sabres drawn uh, and being mown down. And the few, the few cavalrymen that actually get to the tanks kind of bash the top of the tanks with their sabres. And they're sort of, you know, they're surprised that they're actually made of metal, you know, as if, as if these people are, you know, complete fools and complete, you know, ignorant backwoodsmen. Now, so, you know, this is something that is, has been propagated post-war as well. Um, and we need to put this myth to bed finally you know it's 2020 um we're now 80 years on from the events that, that the book describes we need to put this sort of nonsense to bed polish cavalry was actually um you know the most advanced it was the creme de la creme really of of, um, of polish forces in 39 um crucially they fought dismounted so they had actually you know rewritten their their um uh, their modus operandi between the napoleonic wars in 1939 they fought dismounted they used the horses effectively for mobility they used to sort of um tow these artillery pieces and so on behind them put themselves into position the horses would be taken away and they were very actually very effective fighters you look at the story of you know battles for example the um the battle of mokra on the 1st of september which i mentioned in the book um, is a perfect example of how the polish cavalry fought and fought very well against german armor you know, they fought dismounted with anti-tank uh, uh, artillery uh, and anti-tank rifles as well and were very effective. Um, now they, that said, there are examples where they did use a traditional, uh, you know, cavalry charge. Now that wasn't their normal modus operandi in 1939, but they could still do it. They could still do it against infantry, for example. Can you imagine being an infantryman and being charged by cavalry? I mean, you, you would... You know, you'd have to change your trousers afterwards if you survived, because it would be terrifying. And it did work, right? So this actually worked very well in certain cir circumstances. 
Um, but of course, the Germans, you know, would, would sort of take those examples and say, ah, oh, these fools are attacking us on horseback and we just have to mow them down because they're, they're foolish poles. You know, so that's where the myth comes from. It, the history is always much more complicated than these sort of simplified mythologies. So there are examples of the poles charging, but they charge infantry. You know, there's, there's examples of cavalry on cavalry engagements in September 39. So again, the, the argument that, you know, the Germans are all in tanks and the Poles are all on horseback, again, it's nonsense. The Germans have more cavalry than the Poles do in 1939. So there's all sorts of nuances and sort of subtleties in this that we need to bring out. But fundamentally, the idea that the Poles charged German tanks in 1939 is nonsense, and we need to put it to bed. There's quite a lot of these um, conspiracies and, and falsified things. I mean, Roger speaks about a lot of it in his book, but yeah. um, we could go on about this for ages and, and the show would be two or three hours long. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, we don't have two or three hours, uh, however much we'd love to have Roger on. But what I'd love for you to plug your book one last time before we do yeah. sign off. Yeah. Uh, so please tell us a little bit about it. Well, I, uh, I kind of... Um adumbrated, wonderful word, on a sunny day. I've foreshadowed all of the, uh, the things that I would uh, that I sort of deal with in the book. I, I wanted to put the Polish campaign back on the historical map, as it were, because I think it has been ignored. Um, it usually gets, you know, a couple of pages in these standard histories, and, and they, you rarely hear a Polish voice, um, you know, contemporary Polish voice, uh, in those sort of standard histories. So I wanted to rectify those Missions. I wanted to put it back on the map um, and actually give the Poles back a voice in this in this narrative. Um, so, and, and at the same time, also to uh, attack that mythology. So that mythology of you know on the German side of cavalry against tanks, that old myth, uh, and the Soviet side, and now the Russian side, courtesy of Putin, um, the idea that the, that the Soviets didn't invade Poland at all in 1939 when they patently did. <laughs> um, so this is another myth that, that Mr. Putin is now trying to resurrect. Um, so that's another one that needs to be put to bed. And then, and then also to sort of put it within that wider context, as I mentioned, to describe it as a sort of an Anglo, uh, Anglo-Polish, French, you know, combined operation, which is how the Poles certainly viewed it. So there's a lot, there's a lot there that I wanted to try and do. But you know, crucially, it was to tell uh, a really quite, you know, a ripping story. It's quite a, it's quite a fascinating story. There are lots of voices in there. There's lots of archival material, lots of first-hand material, you know, diaries and interviews and so on. Um, so there's a there's no shortage of kind of you know human interest to put it that way uh, in the book. And I, as I said, uh, you know, it, I've been told, and I hope it is. It's a it's a sort of a, a gripping read. I had a very nice email from a reader the other day saying, you know, pick this up um, during lockdown, and I can't put it down. It's brilliant, which is wonderful. It's lovely to hear that. Uh, when you're a writer. So that's really, really gratifying. But I think more importantly, you know, the historian in me, um, I do feel like I've sort of filled a gap. And I think that was an important gap to fill as well. So uh, I heartily recommend it to all our listeners. I totally and utterly agree. So ladies and gentlemen, if you missed out on the title, the title is First to Fight, The Polish War, 1939. You can get it on Amazon, your local bookstores. Uh, I think it's available in America now, isn't it? Um, uh, it's coming out in May in America. If America perfect. is alive in May, it's coming out there then. Yeah. Perfect. There's a Polish version uh, as well that I've seen out here in the Polish shops. So if yeah. you want to pick up a Polish version. On that note, I'm going to pass you over to Alex because um, I want to find out who we've got tomorrow. Thank you so much, Roger. That was fascinating. You've held my attention, my not only on World War II, but um, a sort of out there campaign in World War II um, the whole time you've been on, which is, as Alina will know, is an absolute miracle for me because um, it didn't involve singing and dancing or any uh, slapstick <laughs> comedy. Um, so well done. and Thank you very much. I look forward to reading it. Tomorrow you can join us to uh, listen to us talk to Leslie Downer, um, who talks to us about Japanese history, her love for it, um, and where in Japanese history you should set your historical fiction. Until then, uh, stay safe. If you can, stay at home. And this is Nighthawk signing off.